Section 11 of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 5, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 36. Henry the Fourth, Catholic King, 1593 to 1610. Part 6. Henry the Fourth did not delude himself as to the tendency of such organization amongst those of his late party. Quote, he rebuffed very sternly and wisely, says Lestoile, those who spoke to him of it. As for a protector, he told them, he would have them to understand that there was no other protector in France but himself for one side or the other. The first man who should be so daring as to assume the title would do so at the risk of his life. He might be quite certain of that. End quote. Had Henry the Fourth been permitted to read the secrets of a not so very distant future, he might have told the Huguenots of his day that the time was not so far off when their pretension to political organization and to the formation of a state within the state would compromise their religious liberty and furnish the absolute government of Louis the Fourteenth with excuses for abolishing the protective edict which Henry the Fourth's sympathy was on the point of granting them, and which, so far as its purely religious provisions went, was duly respected by the sagacity of Cardinal Richelieu. After his conversion to Catholicism, and during the whole of his reign, it was one of Henry the Fourth's constant anxieties to show himself well disposed towards his old friends, and to do for them all he could without compromising the public peace in France, or abdicating in his own person the authority he needed to maintain order and peace. Some of the edicts published by his predecessors during the intervals of civil war, notably the Edict of Poitiers issued by Henry III, had granted the Protestants free exercise of their worship in the castles of the Calvinistic lords who had jurisdiction to the number of thirty-five hundred and in the faubourg of one town or borough of each bailiwick of the realm, except the bailiwick of Paris. Further, the holding of properties and heritages, union by marriage with Catholics, and the admission of Protestants to the employments, offices, and dignities of the realm were recognized by this edict. These rights, in black and white, had often been violated by the different authorities, or suspended during the wars. Henry the Fourth maintained them, or put them in force again, and supported the application of them, or decreed the extension of them. It was calculated that there were in France eight hundred towns and three hundred bailiwicks, or seneschalties. The treaties concluded with the League had expressly prohibited the exercise of Protestant worship in forty towns and seventeen bailiwicks. Henry the Fourth tolerated it everywhere else. The prohibition was strict as regarded Paris and ten leagues round, but as early as 1594, three months after his entry into Paris, Henry aided the reformers in the unostentatious celebration of their own form in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, and he authorized the use of it at court for religious ceremonies, especially for marriages. Three successive edicts, two issued at Mantes in 1591 and 1593, and the third at Saint-Germain in 1597, confirmed and developed these signs of progress in the path of religious liberty. The parliaments had in general refused to enregister these decrees, a fact which gave them an incomplete and provisional character, but equitable and persistent measures on the king's part prevailed upon the Parliament of Paris to enregister the Edict of Saint-Germain and the Parliament of Dijon and nearly all the other parliaments of the kingdom followed this example. One of the principal provisions of this last edict declared Protestants competent to fill all the offices and dignities of the kingdom. It had many times been inserted in preceding edicts, but always rejected by the parliaments or formally revoked. Henry the Fourth brought it into force and credit by putting it extensively in practice without entering upon discussion of it and without adding any comment upon it. In 1590 he had given Palseuil the government of Neuchâtel in Normandy. He had introduced Hureau du Fay, Du Plessis Mornay and Rosny into the Council of State. In 1594 he had appointed the last a member of the Council of Finance. Sofre de Collignon, La Force, Lesdiguières and Sancy were summoned to the most important functions. Turenne, in 1594, was raised to the dignity of Marshal of France, and in 1595 La Tremoille was made Duke and Peer. They were all Protestants. Their number and their rank put the matter beyond all dispute. It was a natural consequence of the social condition of France. It became an habitual practice with the government. 
Nevertheless, the complaints and requirements of the malcontent Protestants continued, and became day by day more vehement. In 1596 and 1597, the assemblies of Saumur, Loudun, and Vendôme became their organs of expression, and messengers were sent with them to the camp before La Fere, which Henry IV was at that time besieging. He deferred his reply. Two of the principal Protestant leaders, the Dukes of Bouillon and La Tremoille, suddenly took extreme measures. They left the king and his army, carrying off their troops with them, one to Auvergne and the other to Poitou. The deputies from the assembly of Loudun started back again at the same time, as if for the purpose of giving the word to arm in their provinces. Du Plessis Mornay and his wife, the most zealous of the Protestants, who were faithful at the same time to their cause and to the king, bear witness to this threatening crisis. Quote, the deputies, says Madame du Mornay in her memoir, returned each to his own province with the intention of taking the cure of their evils into their own hands, whence would infallibly have ensued trouble enough to complete the ruin of this state had not the king, by the management of M. du Plessis, been warned of this imminent danger, and by him persuaded to send off and treat in good earnest with the said assembly. End quote. Quote, these gentry, rebuffed at court, says Du Plessis Mornay himself in a letter to the Duke of Bouillon, have resolved to take the cure into their own hands. To that end they have been authorized, and by actions which do not seem to lead them directly thither, they will find that they have passed the Rubicon right merrily. End quote. It was, as it were, a new and a Protestant league just coming to a head. Henry the Fourth was at that time engaged in the most important negotiation of his reign after a long and difficult siege he had just retaken amiens he thought it a favourable moment at which to treat for peace with spain and put an end to an onerous war which he had been for so long sustaining he informed the queen of england of his intention quote, begging her if the position of her affairs did not permit her to take part in the treaty he was meditating with spain to let him know clearly what he must do to preserve amity and good understanding between the two crowns for he would always prefer an ally like her to reconciled foes such as the spaniards he addressed the same notification to the dutch government Elizabeth on one hand, and the States-General on the other, tried to dissuade him from peace with Spain, and to get him actively re-engaged in the strife from which they were not disposed to emerge. He persisted in his purpose whilst setting before them his reasons for it, and binding himself to second faithfully their efforts by all pacific means. A congress was opened in January 1598 at Vervin in Picardy, through the mediation of Pope Clement VIII anxious to become the pacificator of Catholic Europe. The French plenipotentiaries, Pompon de Bélièvre and Brûlard de Sillery, had instructions to obtain the restoration to the king of all towns and places taken by the Spaniards from France since the Treaty of Peace at Cateau Cambrécy, and to have the Queen of England and the United Provinces, if they testified a desire for it, included in the treaty, or at any rate to secure for them a truce. After three months' conferences, the Treaty of Peace was concluded at Vervin on the 2nd of May, 1598, the principal condition being that King Philip II should restore to France the towns of Calais, Ardre, Doulan, Le Catelet, and Blavet, that he should re-enter upon possession of the Countship of Chalorais, and that if either of the two sovereigns had any claims to make against one of the states their allies in this treaty, quote, he should prosecute them only by way of law, before competent judges, and not by force, in any manner whatever. End quote. The Queen of England took no decisive resolution. When once the treaty was concluded, Henry the Fourth, on signing it, said to the Duke of Epernon, quote, with this stroke of my pen I have just done more exploits than I should have done in a long while with the best swords in my kingdom. End quote. A month before the conclusion of the Treaty of Peace at Vervin with Philip II, Henry IV had signed and published at Paris on the 13th of April, 1598, the Edict of Nantes, his Treaty of Peace with the Protestant malcontents. This treaty, drawn up in ninety-two open and fifty-six secret articles, was a code of old and new laws regulating the civil and religious position of Protestants in France, the conditions and guarantees of their worship, their liberties, and their special obligations in their relations whether with the crown or with their Catholic fellow-countrymen. By this code Henry the Fourth added a great deal to the rights of the Protestants and to the duties of the state towards them. 
their worship was authorized not only in the castles of the lord's high justiciary who numbered thirty-five hundred but also in the castles of simple noblemen who enjoyed no high justiciary rights provided that the number of those present did not exceed thirty two towns or two boroughs instead of one had the same religious rights in each bailiwick or seneschalty of the kingdom the state was charged with the duty of providing for the salaries of the protestant ministers and rectors in their colleges or schools and an annual sum of one hundred and sixty five thousand livres of those times or four hundred and ninety five thousand francs of the present day was allowed for that purpose donations and legacies to be so applied were authorized the children of protestants were admitted into the universities colleges schools and hospitals without distinction between them and catholics there was great difficulty in securing for them in all the parliaments of the kingdom impartial justice and a special chamber called the edict chamber was instituted for the trial of all causes in which they were interested catholic judges could not sit in this chamber unless with their consent and on their presentation in the parliaments of bordeaux toulouse and grenoble the edict chamber was composed of two presidents one a catholic and the other a reformer and of twelve councillors of whom six were reformers the parliaments had hitherto refused to admit reformers into their midst in the end the parliament of paris admitted six one into the edict chamber and five into the appeal chamber or enquete the edict of nantes retained at first for eight years and then for four more in the hands of the protestants the towns which war or treaties had put in their possession and which numbered it is said two hundred the king was bound to bear the burden of keeping up their fortifications and paying their garrisons and henry the fourth devoted to that object five hundred and forty thousand livres of those times or about two million francs of our day when the edict thus regulating the position and rights of protestants was published it was no longer on their part but on that of the catholics that lively protests were raised many catholics violently opposed the execution of the new law they got up processions at tours to excite the populace against the edict and at le mans to induce the parliament of normandy to reject it the parliament of paris put in the way of its registration retardations which seemed to forebode a refusal henry summoned to the louvre deputies from all the chambers quote, what i have done he said to them is for the good of peace i have made it abroad i wish to make it at home necessity forced me to this decree they who would prevent it from passing would have war you see me in my closet i speak to you not in royal robe or with sword and cape as my predecessors did nor as a prince receiving an embassy but as a father of a family in his doublet conversing familiarly with his children it is said that i am minded to favour them of the religion there is a mind to entertain some mistrust of me i know that cabals have been got up in the parliament that seditious preachers have been set on the preachers utter words by way of doctrine for to build up rather than pull down sedition that is the road formerly taken to the making of barricades and to proceeding by degrees to the parricide of the late king i will cut the roots of all these factions i will make short work of those who foment them i have scaled the walls of cities you may be sure i shall scale barricades you must consider that what i am doing is for a good purpose and let my past behaviour go bail for it parliaments and protestants all saw that they had to do not only with a strong-willed king but with a judicious and a clear-sighted man a true french patriot who was sincerely concerned for the public interest and who had won his spurs in the art of governing parties by making for each its own place in the state it was scarcely five years ago that the king who was now publishing the edict of nantes had become a catholic the parliaments enregistered the decree the protestant malcontents resigned themselves to the necessity of being content with it whatever their imperfections and the objections that might be raised to them the peace of vervin and the edict of nantes were amidst the obstacles and perils encountered at every step by the government of henry the fourth the two most timely and most beneficial acts in the world for france four months after the conclusion of the treaty of vervin on the thirteenth of september fifteen ninety eight Philip II died at the Escurial, quote, prison, cloister, and tomb all in one, as M. Rousseau Saint-Hilaire very well remarks. Histoire d'Espagne, pages 335 to 363, situated eight leagues from Madrid. 
Philip was so ill and so cruelly racked by gout and fever that it was doubted whether he could be removed thither, quote, but a collection of relics, amassed by his orders in germany had just arrived at the escurial and the festival of consecration was to take place within a few days i desire that i be born alive thither where my tomb already is said philip he was laid in a litter borne by men who walked at a snail's pace in order to avoid all shaking forced to halt every instant he took six days to do the eight leagues which separated him from his last resting-place there he died in atrocious agonies and after a very painful operation endured with unalterable courage and calmness he had ordered to be placed in front of his bed the bier in which his body was to lie and the crucifix which his father charles v at his death in the monastery of Yust, had held in his hand during a reign of forty-two years philip the second was systematically and at any price on the score of what he regarded as the divine right of the catholic church and of his own kingship the patron of absolute power in europe earnest and sincere in his faith licentious without open scandal in his private life unscrupulous and pitiless in the service of the religious and political cause he had embraced he was capable of any lie one might almost say of any crime without having his conscience troubled by it a wicked man and a frightful example of what a naturally cold and hard spirit may become when it is a prey to all the temptations of despotism and to two sole passions egotism and fanaticism after the death of philip the second and during the first years of the reign of his son philip the third war continued between spain on one side and england the united provinces and the german protestants on the other but languidly and without any results to signify henry the fourth held aloof from the strife all the while permitting his huguenot subjects to take part in it freely and at their own risks on the third of april sixteen o three a great second royal personage queen elizabeth disappeared from the scene she had been as regards the protestantism of europe what philip the second had been as regards catholicism a powerful and able patron but what philip the second did from fanatical conviction elizabeth did from patriotic feeling she had small faith in calvinistic doctrines and no liking for puritanic sects the catholic church the power of the pope excepted was more to her mind than the anglican church and her private preferences differed greatly from her public practices besides she combined with the exigencies of a king's position the instincts of a woman she had the vanities rather than the weaknesses of one she would fain have inspired and responded to the passions natural to one but policy always had the dominion over her sentiments without extinguishing them and the proud sovereign sent to the block the overweening and almost rebel subject whom she afterwards grievously regretted these inconsistent resolutions and emotions caused elizabeth's life to be one of agitation though without warmth and devoid of serenity as of sweetness and so when she grew old she was disgusted with it and weary of it she took no pleasure any more in thing or person she could no longer bear herself either in her court or in her bed or elsewhere she decked herself out to lie stretched upon cushions and there remain motionless casting about her vague glances which seemed to seek after that for which she did not ask she ended by repelling her physicians and even refusing nourishment when her ministers saw her thus almost insensible and dying they were emboldened to remind her of what she had said to them one day at whitehall quote, my throne must be a king's throne End quote. At this reminder she seemed to rouse herself and repeated the same words, adding, quote, I will not have a rascal, or vaurien, to succeed me. End quote. Sir Robert Cecil asked her what she meant by that expression. Quote, I tell you that I must have a king to succeed me. Who can that be but my cousin of Scotland? End quote. After having indicated the king of Scotland, James Stuart, son of the fair rival whom she had sent to the block, Elizabeth remained speechless the archbishop of canterbury commenced praying breaking off at intervals twice the queen signed to him to go on her advisers returned in the evening and begged her to indicate to them by signs if she were still of the same mind she raised her arms and crossed them above her head then she seemed to fall into a dreamy state at three o'clock during the night she quietly passed away some few hours afterwards her councils in assembly resolved to proclaim james stuart king of scotland king of england as the nearest of kin to the late queen and indicated by her on her deathbed. 
End of section 11.